Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> I'm Pastor Craig Beeman, and it's good to be with you here for Parish Prayers and Beyond. And we're going to continue looking at the fundamentals of our faith. The fundamentals of our faith. These are beliefs that we hold dear to us, beliefs that we feel are basic and um, important if you claim to be a follower of Christ. These are beliefs that we, we, we've got these narrowed down and we believe that these beliefs uh, are important and necessary in order to be a Christian. Uh, and you'll find as we go along through these, you'll not find us talking uh, about you have to not dance in order to be a Christian. You're not going to find little traditional things uh, in these fundamentals of the faith. Why? Because the fundamentals are important and most important. These are those beliefs that we believe you must believe and trust and agree with in order to be a child of God. And so these anything else, all these extra little things that some churches put on thing, you know, put on you uh, uh, and say, yeah, I mean, for years people have said, well, Baptists don't dance. Well, I've often felt that we don't because we can't. <laughs> Many of us don't know how, uh, but there are some who do. And really, I think that's one of those traditional things that Baptists took up a long time ago because a lot of the dancing that took place uh, early on uh, was cheek to cheek, close. I mean, that was close dancing, and that could, you know, that could lead to feelings that we shouldn't have toward each other if we're not married. That kind of thing, I think, uh, is the main reason why a long time ago, long time ago, uh, Baptists said we don't dance. Uh, but there's a lot of little things that uh, do not alter your salvation, and, and but sometimes churches stick those things on you and say, well, in order to be a good Christian, you got to do this. Well, we're looking at the fundamentals. We're looking at these basic beliefs that we believe you must agree with in order to be a believer, a follower of Jesus. And where do we get these beliefs? <laughs> you may have guessed, we get them directly from the Bible. That's where our beliefs should come from. The Bible teaches us and we should accept what it teaches. I mean, that's just, you know, that seems to me very basic. Uh, it's not what man made up, but it's what God has decided is necessary. So tonight, fundamentals of our faith, and we're talking about Jesus tonight. Jesus, who is He? Who is Jesus? The Bible tells us about His birth. Uh, it was like none other. Uh, most of us know how He got here. He was born of a Virgin Mary. Uh, she had not had relations with her uh, intended, her fiancé, her uh, boyfriend, her fiancé, uh, but she was going to have a child because God had made that possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. There were messages from angels sent by God to tell Mary about this and to tell Joseph about this, that it was going to be okay. Uh, a lot of faith there on both of them, you know, both of them uh, to believe and trust in the Lord that this was going to be okay, and they had that faith. Uh, not only do we know when Jesus arrived, or not exactly what day, but we know how he arrived on this earth. We all, we all, we do know also that he has always been. Now that's tough to handle. That's tough to think about. In John one chapter or chapter one verse one, the Bible says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." In uh, John eight chapter uh, chapter eight verse fifty eight. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus has always been with us. He's always been. Uh, the Bible teaches also that He is Creator. Uh, well, is Jesus God? most important reason that Jesus must be God is that if He is not, His death would have not been sufficient enough to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. A created being, which Jesus would be if He were not God, could not pay the infinite penalty required for sin against an infinite God. Only God could pay such an infinite penalty. Only God could take on the sins of the world, die 
and be resurrected, proving His victory over sin and death. So is Jesus God? Yes. Jesus declared Himself to be God. His followers believed Him to be God. The provision of salvation only works if Jesus is God. Jesus is God incarnate. In other words, He is God in the flesh, uh, the eternal Alpha and Omega, and God is our Savior. And so, yes, Jesus is God. If He were not, now listen, if you've had a personal experience you've, with God, you've asked Him to come into your heart, you've said, Dear God, I'm a sinner, would you please come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and be in charge of my life. If you said that, if you prayed that, if you told God that, and you believed it with all your heart, and you believed that He could save you, then He did. And you know a difference has been made in your life. You know that. You know the difference has been made. Something is different. You're a new creature in Christ. And so you know that, it, that it's true because we don't accept that which is not true and it work. I mean, it just can't. That's not how that happens. Uh, and here I am. <laughs> uh, through John, we also know that Jesus is Creator. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Whoa! God, through Christ, created all that there is. Jesus is Creator. Apart from Him, nothing came into being uh, that has come into being. I mean, uh, Jesus is Creator. Isn't that interesting? I don't know that we've ever thought about that. I know I have. Uh, someone pointed it out to me, and I thought, look at that. That's amazing. Uh, again, how do we know uh, about Jesus? We know about Jesus because it's, He's found in the Word of God. The Word of God that God has preserved teaches us about Jesus. Jesus was fully man and fully God. How do we know this? John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. He was fully God, and yet he became a man. When he became a human like us, he did not lose that which makes him God. He did not lose his divinity. Um, he still had the stuff that made him God. Neither his humanness or his divinity was diminished as he lived on this earth. He was hungry like we are. He grew tired. He endured physical pain and felt human sorrow. He was even tempted as we are tempted. But he also healed the sick. He exercised the power of God over nature and he forgave sin. John 3.16 is known as the mini gospel. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He did not sin. Uh, sin. Huh. He died on the cross. He was buried. And after three days in the grave, He arose. He lived again. How do we know this? Because the Bible teaches it. And if we trust God's Word, we know it's true. We know it's true. Herschel Hobbes wrote this. He said, At the cross are shown the deepest depth of sin and the highest level of the love of God. As believers, we believe that Jesus' death was substitutionary. In John 11, verse 50, we find, Nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. In the phrase, for the people, the word translated for in the English means instead of, instead of, instead of you that one man die for the people. In other words, instead of us having to die for our sins, Jesus died in our place. The punishment that we deserve was placed on Him. If we trust that as the Bible teaches, then we are able to have eternal life. Well, how do you feel or, or how do you respond to someone who, who has died for you? How do you respond to them? Well, you may say, well, if somebody died for me, they're gone, they're dead. Ah, but Jesus is alive. So if Jesus is alive, then how do you respond to him? What, what is your response to someone who would go that far for you? Jesus' death was a once and for all occasion. According to Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 through 27, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, 
separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. What does that mean? It means he is the ultimate sacrifice. It means that when he died on the cross, he did it, and he did it, and that was enough. He did it, and that was enough enough. That's all that needed to occur. That's all that needed to happen. He doesn't need to die again on the cross. He doesn't need to die every, again on the cross every time we sin. When He died on the cross, that was it. He paid the penalty for our sins. He paid the penalty for all of our sins. Once He died, and that's all it took because He was perfect. What, is this, what does the resurrection prove about Jesus? What does the resurrection prove about Jesus? proves his deity, that which makes him God. Jesus is coming back to get us. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus is coming back, and this is what we believe. We believe that he died on that cross for our sins. We believe that he died in our place for us uh, so that we didn't have to die because of our sins. We believe that Jesus is Creator. Th these things are all taught in the Word of God, and if you read the Word of God, you find these truths. And we believe that this is very important, that you believe that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back uh, because it's in the Bible, and, it's in, and the Bible teaches us about who Jesus is. And so we believe these beliefs are very important for you as a believer to believe. In just a few moments, we'll have some uh, uh, announcements, uh, but those will be following some prayer requests. And we ask that you join us uh, in praying for those prayer requests that appear on your screen in just a few moments. I'm going to have a word of prayer with you before we do that, though. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, O oh God, for our day that we have today. And Father, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Father, your word teaches us these things. And I know that a lot of churches, a lot of denominations have come up with a lot of extra stuff. But Father, we have your word and that's the only thing we can trust. So help us to trust your word and to believe what your word teaches about your son Jesus. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us today for Parish Prayers and Beyond. Until next, well, until next Sunday, we'd love to have you come Sunday. Sunday at 9.45, we've got a Bible study for all ages. And then at 10.55, we've got time of worship, a time of worship for all of us. So join us this Sunday if you can. We'd love to meet you and greet you. Uh, again, uh, let me remind you about Upward Soccer. Sign up your child. Sign up your child today, ages 5 through 12. Uh, or you can do that online at fbcwinsboro.com. Until next time, I'm Pastor Craig Beeman, and this has been Parish Prayers and Beyond.